Amelia Earhart left from Leh, Papua New Guinea for Howland Island on July 2 at 10 a.m. in 1937. While attempting to fly around the world at the equator, Amelia and her navigator Fred Noonan never got to Howland Island. After they failed to arrive at Howland Island distress calls were heard for several days. An extensive search ensued. Historically the largest search for a down aircraft ever. For over 85 years there have been numerous attempts to find the missing aircraft but no one has been able to provide any conclusive proof of the wreck location or its existence. There are examples of planes lost before 1937 found in one piece in salt water so it is reasonable to believe Earhart's Lockheed Electra could still be found partially intact. Many of the distress calls suggest they had landed on a different island south of the equator and were transmitting using the plane's radio with hopes of being rescued. After hearing about a previously unknown aircraft resembling an Electra near an island of Papua New Guinea, I began to draw possible explanations and was astonished by the possibility. A young girl named Betty Clank wrote down a distress call she heard on her shortwave radio in the days following the disappearance of Amelia. The notebook she wrote in was not known by researchers until the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery discovered its existence in the year 2000. This document has been talked about extensively among the Earhart theorists and although controversial for several reasons it seems to be a credible transcription of some of Amelia Earhart's actual radio transmissions. Betty's transcription even contains a set of coordinates. South 391065, Z, or E, and also the same coordinates dyslexically reproduced to the right. South 309165, East. Below that we see Fig 8, or Figure 8, followed by more probably decipherable numbers. Previous to Amelia's flight around the world attempt she had actually tried to make the trip going in the opposite direction, east to west, but her flight was cut short when she had an accident during takeoff in Hawaii. She had enlisted Clarence Williams to prepare flight planning materials for her before the first attempt. We do not have the materials she used going west to east around, but we do have these prior attempt materials available and it seems like Fig 8 is a reference to the checkpoint figures across the top of the map. Figure 8 doesn't match the coordinates from the Betty notebook, but Figure 9 looks very close at 3 degrees 11 minutes south 165 degrees east. Reversing the order of the figures is likely how they would have planned the west-to-east attempt having already had the east-to-west flight plan available to reference. When we do this figure 9 now becomes figure 8. Many newspapers also report various transcriptions of distress calls in the days following the disappearance. One report suggests after landing in water, Earhart was waiting for Noonan as he was trying to check longitude and latitude. Why did Amelia say Noonan was trying? Shouldn't this have been something he had done hundreds of times on the trip so far? Getting a celestial fix requires a map, air almanac, sextant, and chronometer. If Noonan had trouble producing coordinates for Amelia to relay what might have caused this. We know on July 1st she delayed the flight because they were having trouble setting the chronometer because of wireless static and a breakdown at the Malabar wireless station. Eric Chater was in lay with Earhart during the preparation for her lay Howland hop. He also tells us about the difficulties setting the chronometer. Chater was a blind flying pioneer, one of the first to come to Australia. Chater was well aware of the importance of obtaining the time signal would be for making the trip over the Pacific Ocean and finding Howland Island having no intermediate landmarks to assist with navigation. After Earhart disappeared, the US government requested information about her stay in lay. Chater responded to the request with a document now known as the Chater Report by Earhart researchers. The request doesn't ask for info about setting the chronometer yet the Chater Report includes a detailed account of how they got the time signal. He goes on. And on.
And finally, this last sentence seems obnoxious or excessive to include when considering nobody asked Chater about the chronometer. Several news articles say post-loss position reports might be wrong due to not being able to check their chronometer. If they had been unable to get an accurate chronometer time before leaving Leigh, this would have also greatly contributed to their inability to find Howland Island. It seems that in Earhart's last message she sent before departing Leigh, she tells us Noonan was not able to set the chronometer. How could Chater be mistaken about the chronometer being set? Was he worried about getting blamed for them not reaching their destination? Maybe in a panic after receiving the request he was lying. It seems like he knew what caused them to get lost. Without trust in a chronometer pinpointing their longitude would be much more difficult but they would still be able to get their latitude and then make an assumption about their longitude using their course. During the flight they were unable to establish two-way communication with Itasca. The Itasca was a ship at Howland Island that was supposed to transmit so they could use their radio direction finding equipment to reach their destination. Having run out of other options and being very lost, they chose a heading and hoped for landfall before exhausting their fuel supply. They find a small island to land on and once on the ground they use their sextant to find a latitude of 3.09 degrees south. They draw a line along the south 3.09 latitude on their map and are so lost they don't realize how far west they are and give Fig 8 as a position because that is where their course intersects the 3.09 latitude line. The electrolyte plane I heard about is at the first land you come to when you follow the latitude line directly west from Fig 8. It is a low-wing radial engine twin, with two-bladed propellers, a round RDF ring antenna, a twin tail with almost round vertical stabilizers. It is about 100 feet deep near a bay on the west side of Lehir Island where they would have been able to land to the north with the tide out and were able to transmit until the plane washed out with the tide. The landing site has terrain to the east making line of sight radio transmissions to the east difficult to receive and explains why ships involved in the search to the east couldn't hear many of the reported transmissions but others along the long path propagation lines could. Now go type this into Google Earth to see where her plane is. Bonus if you find the midpoint of her intended course on the same latitude and draw a line to this location. Notice there are no other islands along the path. 